You are guilty. Nothing went according to plan. You thought that people would be happy that you had found a way over the wall. The view of the other side was absolutely beautiful to you. You didn't have words to describe it. It was so unlike anything you had ever known in your life. It was so bright, green, alive, even oddly happy. You're so eager to show everyone, but 1,922 is not. What you had seen seemed so much better than this wasteland you had spent so long in. But 1,922 is convinced that it would be a terrible risk to leave this well-established and safe life for something new and most likely dangerous. Neither of you know who built the wall, and each of you have different opinions on why it is there. He thinks the wall was built to keep something out. You think it was built to keep the people of this village in. The argument gets heated, and everyone is watching. The little metal rod in 1922's hand is spinning furiously, nearly a blur. Your pent-up rage flares at this minor irritation, and suddenly your hand flies upward of its own accord in an attempt to knock that rod as far away as possible, and show this blind village the truth about their authoritative leader. You wanted to expose his ill-confident speech patterns and make him stutter an explanation at the shocked onlookers as you expose him for his other scams and lies. But it goes wrong. It goes horribly wrong. You strike 1922's hand with all your might, but it doesn't fly in the direction you intended. Instead, the rod plunges deep into 1922's eye. He is knocked off his feet by the force of the impact and is dead before he hits the ground. Onlookers all around you scream, and 1991 runs forward in hysterics. As she cradles the limp corpse in her arms, she stares up at you with a look of utter betrayal and disdain. She whispers, Why? How could you do this? You've ruined everything! You... You killed my father. She looks back down at 1922's face. Dad? Daddy, please don't go. Please, you have to wake up. She sobs as she rocks back and forth, convulsing with utter heartbreak. Onlookers are getting angry. Discombobulated, scared, and unsure of what to do next, you blurt without thinking, But he isn't even your father! I mean, think about it, 1991. Who, who was your mother? It makes sense if you just listen to me. Not looking up. Do you hear 1,991 hiss? How dare you? Finally looking up, she whispers two final words at you, brimming with hatred and detestation. Get out! Her malevolent gaze crashes into you, and you, terrified or momentarily knocked off balance. You squeak a reply without any confidence or joy. Yes, ma'am. You turn to leave, all alone, when you hear another voice, one you had never heard before. I'm afraid we cannot allow you to leave. Standing between you and your exit are three identical men in large black overcoats, black fedoras, and black trousers. I'm afraid this little social experiment has been cancelled. Thanks for nothing, 1993. You, along with everyone else in town, are utterly confused. But before you or anyone else in town can react, two things happen. The man in the black overcoat drops a small capsule on the ground. And both the man in black trousers and the man in the black fedora pull out small, flat sheets of flashing blue light. Also in this instant, you feel two sensations. One. Some invisible wave passes over you and envelops you, and you assume everyone else in town. And two, a blissful feeling, much like that metal rod used to produce, but much stronger. Distrusting that feeling, you spin on the spot and try to run. You see most everyone else around you is entranced by the leaflets of flashing blue light, except for a couple of people you had told about 1922's rod. 
They also distrusted that blissful feeling and tried to run. You are running so fast, but it doesn't seem to you that you are covering any ground. All of your surroundings, though static, keep the same pace as you. You are unable to outrun those dark men who stand perfectly still. The blue flashing light behind you ceases, and everyone who is in a trance falls to the ground, unmoving. The three men casually stroll over to the few who are left standing, easily walking faster than you are running. Soon, you are the only one left standing, and the man in the black fedora, or was it the man in the black overcoat, casually walks over to you. You know, you've caused a lot of trouble, 1,993. You ruined this perfect little town, and why? All because you were... dissatisfied? Angry and confused, you shout questions at this man in black trousers and demand an explanation of who he is. He patiently waits until you have finished and completely ignores all of your questions. As he pulls out his own leaflet of flashing blue light, you ask one final question. Are you going to kill us? He laughs as he holds the flashing light in front of your face and replies, You rebellious sorts are all the same. Close-minded fools. You think that violence produces the only permanent solutions. No matter how much I would like to shoot an evil raven like you from the sky, why throw away what can easily be fixed? Death is no longer a necessary tool in our utopia. The leaflet flashes faster and faster in your eyes. You had no idea there were so many different shades of blue. You try to fight it, but you can feel the bliss seep into your body. Your eyes go numb first, then your head, your chest, your arms, and your legs. Just as you lose all sense that your body is your own, the flashing light crashes to a halt, and the pure momentum of your high throws you on the ground, and your mind sinks into a dark, indigo void of bliss. brought to you by Big Brother. Hello, I'm Anderson Crow, radio host and public voice for Big Brother, and you are listening to your local Teakwood Live broadcast. Today's show is a special one, listeners, and will be mostly devoted to the conclusion of this true story. That's right, listeners, this story that Big Brother has written for me to tell you every so often throughout the past couple of weeks is mostly true. There has been a little bit of embellishment for entertainment purposes, such as the men in black overcoats, trousers, and fedoras. They don't actually exist. That was just a little allusion to a timely myth. This very real man featured in our story leads a sad and lonely life of rebellion and has brought nothing but evil and death to this small town. Thankfully, his rebellion was stifled before he could hurt anyone else. Did you notice how he mercilessly attacked 1,922's memory after brutally killing him? One could easily think that this man has gone too far and that there is no hope for him. But never fear, listeners, because this story, like any good story, is a redemption story. And I can assure you here and now, there is still hope for 1,993. For now, though, I have some news to cover. Today, listeners, is a great day in our history. Today marks the end of the nature war. The end of the war to end all wars, proving once and for all that with technological advancement comes the end of war. War simply no longer has any place in our utopia, and this ever-present force of destruction has finally been destroyed. Actualized Infinity is our salvation from the evils of the outside world. At 6 o'clock this morning, 
Work commenced on the addition of actualized infinity to the wall around the city. The project is expected to be completed very soon. At six o'clock this evening, curfew will be moved back an hour so as to give our wise and benevolent mayor of all she surveys a chance to give a victory speech. Soon, our beautiful city-state will be completely independent from the outside world and never need deal with outside influence again. It is mandatory for all civilians to attend this speech. Before I report on our wise and benevolent mayor of all she surveys victory speech, I have a quick public update to the collection of thinkable thoughts, just handed to me by an agent of Big Brother. It reads, Last week, I read a letter sent to me by a soldier on the front lines of the nature war. Recognition of this letter's existence has now become illegal. It's no big deal. It is just an obsolete letter sent by an obsolete soldier in a now obsolete war. So, disregard it in total. Thank you. And now, for those of you listeners who cannot be at our wise and benevolent mayor of all she surveys grand victory speech, i.e. prisoners and prison guards and other assorted Big Brother agents, I shall read it to you via radio broadcast. Here you go. Citizens of Teakwood City State, today is a day of triumph, a day of pride. It is a day that has taken many years to achieve. Decades ago, our city was in ruins, ravaged by the evils of the outside world. Evils we dare not speak about. And it was then, in this terrible hour of need, that I, your wise and benevolent mayor of all I survey, and my party of seven followers, began to lay the groundwork for this grand, new era of stability. Though a new and very small minority, we have always had the same two goals, to spread our true, ideologically conditioned movement, and to become the sole power in Teakwood, one that would endure against all odds. The citizens of Teakwood are happy in the knowledge that the omnipresent dangers of the outside world have now been replaced by an all-consuming bliss and safety. You citizens will live in eternal bliss which I provide for you. And I ask in return, not for the simple statement, I trust you, but for the pledge, my loyalty is to you. We, like a holy order, have purged all of the evils of this world from our presence, have cleansed ourselves of the ideals of the old teakwood, and have set ourselves apart from the evils of the world that surround us. We, in essence, do not live on this planet Earth any longer. There forever will only be Teakwood. It is my conviction that Teakwood will endure forever. A perfect utopia. Long live Big Brother. Long live our wise and benevolent mayor of all she surveys. Long live Teakwood. Listeners, that was an incredible victory speech given by our wise and benevolent mayor of all she surveys. As you all turn in for the night, or get ready for the night shift, there is one more thing I have to broadcast to you all. I still have to finish Big Brother's story. This finale truly shows the power of Teakwood and Big Brother to rescue even the most rebellious and twisted souls. Here... I give you the conclusion of our story. You are home. All of your life you have been wandering. You walked aimlessly everywhere, from the streets of town to the hazardous wilds outside of the wall and even a junkyard. You have made many egregious mistakes, such as abandoning the safety of Teakwood only to be betrayed by nature or ruining your second chance at a peaceful, innocent, and fulfilling life in the junkyard by inciting individuality and revolution. 
Big Brother has fixed all of that, however. After a long session of intense re-education, they gave you back your memories, as well as a new purpose. Re-education was wonderful and painful, but a good painful. Like, the kind of pain that takes away any thought of ever wanting to do anything that was not deemed good by Big Brother. Kinda like pulling a splinter out of your skin, but more intense. You don't have time to think about that, however. You're too busy excitingly pursuing your new found or new assigned purpose. You feel so happy and fulfilled as you end one more day of broadcasting. Good night, listeners. I am Anderson Crow, and you have been listening to your local Teakwood Live broadcast. I hope you all will join me for tomorrow's broadcast, and the next day, and the day after that, and so on, until I am no longer capable of broadcasting. So long, folks, and remember, all is bliss.